title of my talk today is uh, Development of High Capacity Anodes for Rechargeable Alkali Metal Batteries uh, Using Nanostructured uh, Alloying Materials. I guess that should be Alkali Metal Ion Batteries. So uh, I specifically didn't put in Lithium Ion Batteries because the, we're, we're expanding beyond Lithium Ion now. So I have a couple of slides at the end on sodium ion and potassium ion uh, battery development that we're doing. But I would say the focus, the, the main focus will be on uh, lithium ion battery development. OK, so just to um, give you a, an overview of what I'll be talking about. So first, I just give a, a brief background to lithium ion battery technology. Um, so what's the conventional technology at the moment and, and why we're looking to alloying materials, um, specifically at the anode. Uh, I'm going to talk about the importance of nanostructuring uh, alloying materials um, uh, and, and why it's important that you have those nano dimensions for, for a stable capacity retention. I'm going to look at something as a very important component of a, a lithium ion battery, which is the solid electrolyte interface layer um, and how do you how you stabilize that. And then lastly, <coughs> how you go about increasing the mass loading of alloying materials for, for lithium ion batteries, which is key if, if you want to commercialize the, the technology. OK, so that's, that's a very uh, high level. I'll, I'll talk about each step along the way in more detail as, as I get through it. OK, so I suppose the, the, the talk itself, uh, I'll be going through um, a lot of background maybe when we started into lithium ion battery research um uh, which was way back published the first paper in 2014 i think um so I'll, I'll give an overview of where we started where we are now and kind of where we're going um with these alloying materials um but to to, to just go to a very fundamental level i'd first like to talk about the the current state of the art in lithium ion battery so uh, lithium ion batteries are the, the dominant rechargeable battery technology on the market and for good reason is, is that they have the highest energy density and the, the, the highest gravimetric energy density and the highest volumetric energy density and that's related to lithium's position on the, the periodic table so it's the atomic number of three so it means it's a very light element um, and has a, a small uh, volume. Um, also has a a uh, very low uh, reduction potential versus a uh, standard hydrogen electrode, uh, which means if you couple it with a cathode material uh, that has a high working potential, well, then you 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 maximize the the voltage of your battery, and therefore you maximize the energy density. So, um, you know, lithium ion batteries are ubiquitous now at the moment. Um, there, you know, any mobile phone that you have, laptops, um, any mobile electronics basically that, that have a battery generally it will be a lithium ion battery. Uh, likewise EVs have, have all have lithium ion batteries um, because again related to their superior energy density. The operating principle of them um, is given here in this schematic so I'm go only going to fo focus on the anode today because that's where the alloying materials um, uh, are used basically or applicable but basically um, if you're not an electrochemist, uh, the, 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 sorry, it's a bit of background noise there. Um, so the, the operating principle of a battery is basically you have an anode and a cathode, and that's separated by a, a polymer separator that's soaked in electrolyte, generally carbonate based. At the cathode, you'll, uh, conventional materials are uh, layered oxide materials basically so something like lithium cobalt oxide although there's a move away from cobalt now uh, towards uh, nickel and manganese you can have uh, polyanine type compounds as well at the cathode something like lithium iron phosphate um, at the anode uh, graphite is, is conventionally used so graphite uh, typically uh, will be uh, the, the majority of lithium ion batteries on, on the market today will have graphite anodes uh, Graphite is a really good anode material um, because of its layered structure. So graphite is it's just basically layers of, of carbon, um, so carbon sheets, so graphene sheets. Um, and that layered structure is very conducive to uh, long cycle life for lithium ion batteries, because basically when you charge the, the, the battery, what happens is lithium migrates from the cathode across the separator and into the anode. And it intercalates between those layers uh, and that's that's not disruptive to the the structure of the graphite it means you can do that reversibly over thousands of cycles with with little capacity fade at least from the anode or at least related to the structure of the anode 
Um, so th that works really well. Um, but one issue is uh, it, it graphite tends to or does have a, a relatively low specific capacity. So it has a capacity of 372 milliamp hours per gram. The reason it has a relatively low capacity compared to alloying materials is due to the, the anode half reaction here, which you can see uh, is this middle reaction here. So for every six carbons, uh, only one lithium ion can be accommodated. Okay, so that's um, not a very good ratio. So if you move or if you want to increase the energy density of a lithium ion battery just by swapping out the, the anode material, well, then uh, alloying materials like silicon, germanium and tin, so group four materials or group 14 materials, um, they actually can accommodate much more lithium. OK, so if you look at the alloying reaction here, so if we, if we take silicon to be the example, silicon will react with uh, lithium ions plus electrons to form a lithium silicon alloy. And each silicon atom can accommodate up to 3.75 lithium ions um, at room temperature. So that's a considerable amount more than what carbon can. So if you remember carbon, six carbons to one lithium, here you have one lithium, uh, sorry, 3.75 lithiums to one silicon. So that results in uh, the gravimetric capacity of silicon being uh, an order of magnitude higher than, than what it is for carbon. So you might ask, well, then why don't you just swap the anode material for silicon uh, and of course it, it's not as straightforward as that is because uh, along with this alloying reaction here you get a very large volume expansion so if you use a micro scaled uh, electrode uh, or a film of silicon basically what happens is it just pulverizes um, so the, the large volume expansion you can, you can, it can be up, upwards of 300 percent and just causes the material to pul pulverize if it pulverizes it loses contact with the current collector and what you'll see um, after a very few cycles you'll see the capacity begin to just fall off the cliff okay so there has to be um, uh, you have to mitigate that somehow so that's one of the major challenges um, with with uh, the incorporation of an alloying material as an anode for lithium ion battery so it's that large, large volume expansion that leads to loss of contact with the current collector there are other challenges um, and the, the second one is an unstable solid electrolyte interface layer. I'll talk about what that means in, in more detail later in the talk. But basically, the SEI layer um, is um, because of the potentials that lithium ion batteries operate at, the electrolyte is, is unstable. So what you get in the first cycle or the first initial cycles uh, is you get decomposition of the electrolyte at the surface of the, uh, the graphite anode. And this happens at silicon as well. Um, so that's uh, th th this actually is, is beneficial in a graphite anode because it passivates the surface of the anode, but it's not um, beneficial in a silicon uh, electrode because it's unstable. So what you get is you get continuous decomposition of the electrolyte um, with every cycle. So that's um, something that does need to be overcome um, if you want to cycle silicon or germanium for thousands of cycles. Um, Another challenge related to these alloying materials is that it's difficult to get commercially relevant mass loadings. OK, so you want to be upwards of one milligram per centimeter squared for silicon, certainly, and, you know, probably even beyond that. So above 1.6 or 1.7 milligrams per centimeter squared, if possible. Um, so that is a challenge, getting that amount of material onto um, a, a current collector uh, and have it perform stably. OK, so if, if we look at the first challenge then, so overcoming the, the loss of the contact with the current collector related to the volume expansion. Uh, so like I said, you know, if you use micro sized or micron sized particles uh, or films, basically all you, you, you get is, is pulverization. Um, so there was uh, the seminal work on, on uh, the use of nanostructured silicon was done by a professor uh, each way in Stanford back in 2007. He, pu he published this in, in Nature Nanotechnology. So he put forward um, the, the use of silicon nanowires instead of um, films or particles. And so nanowires are very uh, good material as, as an anode because basically you can grow them directly from the substrate. You can grow them directly from the current collector. Um, which means you don't need binders or conductive additives, uh, which are inactive materials that would be used in for, for graphite electrodes, for example. So they're inactive, um, but th so it means they don't uh, add to the capacity. So 
um, they reduce the overall uh, specific capacity of your anode. You don't need those for nanowire type um, uh, anodes. So, uh, like I said, the, the professor uh, each way in Stanford um, pioneered this technique. So to, to use nanowires grown directly from, from current collectors as the anode material. What that does is because every nanowire is directly contacted to the current collector, you get good electrical and, and efficient uh, electron transport from the current collector. The nano dimensions then um, mitigate against pulverization. So nanowires won't pulverize. So the stresses within the material, uh, because it's nanostructured, are much less. So they don't crack and lose contact with the current collector. Now, they do change their morphology, which, which I'll get to later, but they, they don't lose contact with the current collector, which is, which is uh, very, very important. So that kind of led us to do our very first uh, publication in this area, which, like I said, was back in 2014. Um, and it's useful to talk. I know that that's a long time ago now, but it's useful to talk about it because it, it, uh, this gives a good sense of how these nanowire type materials behave uh, and, and kind of how they change their morphology as, as, as you cycle them. Um, so we started looking at germanium nanowires first. So um, uh, Kevin, uh, in, in his lab, has developed the, the solvent vapor growth system for nanowire growth. Um, so basically, the solvent vapor growth system is you, you have a, um, a long neck flask that you place into a, a furnace, a high temperature furnace. Uh, within that flask, you have a high boiling point solvent. solvent and also within that flask, you place your, your current collector uh, with your seed material attached. So the, the current collector in this case was stainless steel. The seed material was tin, and that those tin seeds, when you inject in a uh, germanium precursor, um, will seed nanowire growth. Uh, um, if you reflux it at 430 degrees for 10 minutes, you get nice dense nanowire growth on the surface of the current collector. So um, we uh, decided to look at germanium first, uh, I suppose, because germanium has, has not only does it have a high capacity, it's not as high as silicon, I would say, it's about a third that of silicon, but it has much higher conductivity and a higher uh, lithium diffusivity. So um, we, we decided to look at germanium first. Uh, when we did, uh, well, sorry, this is what the uh, SEM of the nanowires after growth, so this is pristine material. Um, and you can see you do get dense nanowire growth across the, the, the substrate. And there's a high mag image there where you can clearly see the tin seed at the end. Um, so what we did then is we took that material um, and we uh, used it as the, the working electrode in, in a swage lock type cell is what we use. So swage lock type cell is a very uh, basic uh, test cell that we, that we can assemble quite easily in the lab. Um, so what we had was on one side, we had it's a two electrode set up. On one side, we had the nanowires grown directly from the current collector on one side, separator. Um, soaked in, in a carbonate based electrolyte and then the other was uh, the counter electrode was lithium metal. So when we charged and discharged these, uh, we found that they had an excellent capacity retention. So we were able to get well over a thousand cycles with excellent uh, uh, or minimal capacity fade, I would say. So there was a capacity fade initially but which stabilized after more or less, the, so the, the, you can see a slope change here after about 100 cycles. Um, and beyond that then uh, was, was very stable. Um, so we were obviously very happy with this. Um, uh, from 300 cycles on, you can see uh, the electrode retained about 99.1% of, of its capacity. So which we were, as I said, we were very, very happy with. So we wanted to look into why they performed so well. Um, so we did some material analysis before and after cycling to kind of investigate what does the material look like afterwards. So the prevailing wisdom in the field at the time was that nanowires perform well because they maintain their morphology. So they don't pulverize and they maintain the nanowire morphology. So what we were expecting to see after a thousand cycles uh, was that we would take apart the cell, uh, wash the material, have a look at it on the SEM or the TEM, and we would still see our nanowires, albeit maybe slightly deformed. And um, that's not what we saw. So what we saw was this porous network of, of uh, ligaments, basically, of the active material of germanium. Um, so we investigated that further, uh, and we did uh, kind of 
staged charging uh, or sorry staged cycling of these so we looked at the material after one 10 20 cycles 300 um sorry 100 and 300 and what we saw then was the, the progressive deforming of the morphology so after one cycle you know you still had nanowires um after 10 you could see the structure had, uh, the, the surface sorry had become much rougher um after 20 it was much more difficult to even make out the individual nanowires and then after 100 and 300 uh, you can see the nanowire morphology is gone and you it's been replaced by this um, porous interconnected network of active material importantly between 100 and 300 cycles you don't see any more deformation so uh, what's formed after 100 cycles um, looks almost identical to what you have after 300 cycles which is very good and it's the reason why our material um, has such good capacity retention is because once this structure has formed actually now it doesn't deform any further um, so once you get down to ligament uh, diameter of about five nanometers it doesn't deform any further so if you look at a, a high mag image of that on the TEM you can see very obvious there now that the nanowire morphology is gone and as you zoom in you can see this ligament structure has formed and zoom in, zoom in even further, you can see that roughly, you know, approximately five nanometer diameter uh, consistently for all the ligaments, which says to us or which, which told us that this is actually the, the, the stable morphology that you need. So it's this five nanometers is the, the, the stable morphology. It's not the nanowire initially, it's this structure is the, is the stable structure. Because you'll see this, you know, even if you up, took the material after a thousand cycles, you would still see this the dimension as well so it doesn't deform any further we looked uh, at this process uh, the evolution of it in a little bit more detail then on tem as well uh, what we saw was after one cycle if you look at a, a nanowire you can see these pores have started to form um, so basically what's happening is you know you alloy the material and then you discharge it <coughs> excuse me so you de-alloy it but that leaves behind uh, a vacancy where the lithium has been uh, those vacancies aggregate um, and form pores and basically there's an energetic driving force for that because it, it reduces the overall surface area. Um, as the pores begin to aggregate, so as, as you continue to cycle, the pores begin to aggregate. So you can see the pores get larger and the surface of the nanowires get rougher. Eventually after 20 cycles now, if you look at a single nanowire, you can see those ligaments beginning to form. So that's just the, 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 the nanowire is, is becoming more diffuse. Um, the pores are aggregating and now what's left behind is, is these ligament type structures. So that's after 20 cycles. OK, so we, we put forward the theory then of, of what is causing this deformation. And like I said, it's this pore formation coupled with something known as um, uh, electrochemically assisted welding. So what happens with is not only are you getting pore formation and, and uh, that forms the ligaments, but actually the ligaments, if they're in contact with each other, can weld to each other as well. So that's Im important because it gives you this interconnected network. So the welding occurs because if you have two ligaments in contact with one another, both of them can simultaneously uh, be lithiated. Um, but what you'll get is you can get a bridge, a lithium bridge bonding be between the two ligaments. Um, when that lithium, when that is, is discharged or delithiates, that lithium is removed. And so does the kinetic driving force then for silicon silicon or germanium germanium bond formation at the interface of the two ligaments. So you get welding and pore formation, and both are critical to, the, to, to form that very stable uh, porous structure. Okay, so the, the ultimate goal then was to. to that was all with germanium um, and germanium while it worked very well it is unfortunately very expensive so we, we the, the goal was to move to silicon um, so the initial step we took in that was to look at germanium and silicon on a single electrode so uh, germanium off offers the benefits of the very long cycle life and excellent ray capability and silicon has a very high capacity and is also inexpensive so we combined both on, on a single um, electrode uh, one of the issues we had, we, we wanted to try and grow germanium and silicon nanowires individually on the same electrode, uh, same current collector, but it's difficult because 
anything that will seed germanium growth will also seed silicon growth. So we couldn't just grow them, you know, uh, pattern on different seeds and grow them individually. So because you, you would just, if you tried to grow germanium only, um, all the seeds would be used up. Uh, so what we did then was in, rather than grow them silicon and germanium from the current collector individually, we, we grew heterostructures. So we grew the germanium nanowires first and then we patterned those with tin seeds. So just um, so we attached uh, tin nanoparticles basically using a thiol ligand. Um, so ethane dithiol uh, that attached the tin nanoparticles and then we were able to grow silicon nanowires from the germanium stems. So we had this branch structure. So this is a uh, look at that kind of process on the t on the SEM, excuse me. So you can see you start with your bare nanowire, soak it in the EDT solution, immerse it in the tin nanoparticles, and then grow the silicon nanowires in the solvent vapor growth system then separately. So you get this nice branch structure. And importantly, all the branches are, are well contacted to the stem. When we cycled those, uh, we got very stable capacity over 100 cycles for all three different materials. So we looked at uh, three different ratios, I should say. So two is to one, three is to one, and four is to one germanium to silicon. And what we saw was the higher the germanium content, the lower the capacity, but the better the rate capability. So the reason for that is, as I've said earlier, uh, germanium has a uh, much higher conductivity than silicon and also a better lithium, uh, a rate of lithium diffusion um, within it. So we were able to tailor then basically by, by changing the ratios of germanium to silicon, you can tailor either for high capacity. So if you want high capacity material, you, you increase the amount of silicon that's in there, or you can tailor it for high rate capability. So you want high rate capability, you take you you increase the amount of germanium in there, and that's important for you know it, it it gives you a material now that you can tune. Okay, so graphite you can't really tune. So graphite has its properties and it, those properties are set. But with, with a kind of heterostructure like this, you can tune the the performance of it. So for example, if you want something that uh, a battery that has a very high capacity, but maybe you're not too worried about the power density that's that's achievable from it. Something like a mobile phone. Okay, you don't need to uh, discharge a mobile phone very quickly. Well, then you want something. Uh, you know, you want the high silicon content there because that will give you the high capacity. If you want something that has uh, high power capability, maybe like a power tool. Well, then uh, maybe you want to move towards more germanium. Um, for all cases, we, we saw that the germanium silicon heterostructure behaved better than silicon on its own. OK, so and again, I guess that that's what we expected. OK, so that was the, the initial studies we had on, on these materials. Um, one thing, because uh, as, as I've alluded to on the last slide, we, we ultimately wanted to get to 100 percent silicon, OK, because silicon is cheap um, and germanium is very expensive. So. And also, as, as I've shown you, unfortunately, silicon um, did not be behave or didn't have the same capacity retention that germanium had. So we knew we had, so while silicon will form that porous, interconnected, stable structure, it still doesn't retain the same capacity that germanium does. So we wanted to tackle that and we knew the, the reason for it was the, uh, the SEI layer, so the solid electrolyte interface layer. So like I said in, in the introduction, this is a, a very important component of a lithium ion battery. Um, let's check the time here. Um, OK, so the, the, basically what happens is when you when you charge uh, a anode or, or a lithium ion battery at the anode, uh, you'll get decomposition of the electrolyte. OK, so it's just unstable at the, th those potentials for graphite. This is not a problem um, because the graphite has a, only about a 10% volume expansion when it's fully charged. So what happens is you get decomposition of the electrolyte and it forms this passivating surface. And that SEI layer is quite stable in a graphite anode. Um, that's not the case for silicon. OK, so for silicon, um, because you get the large volume expansion, you do get SEI formation, but it's not stable. Um, so every time because the because you're the, the volume is expanding, uh, and contracting with every cycle, uh, the SEI layer forms and then cracks and forms and cracks and forms and cracks. 
Um, so what that does is it's very detrimental to the performance because you're getting continuing continuous electrolyte decomposition, um, which is thickening the SEI layer, um, and that's basically increasing the impedance in the cell. So it does impact the cell's long-term performance. So what we noted was that for germanium, um, the, the, the SEI layer was much more stable than it was for silicon. So we wanted to try stabilize that SEI layer for silicon in, in hopes that we could uh, um, mimic the, the capacity retention that germanium has. So what we did was we looked at a series of uh, electrolyte additives that stabilized that SEI layer. So typically uh, the, the, the standard uh, electrolyte for lithium ion batteries is carbonate based. So you can use DEC or DMC, so diethyl carbonate or dimethyl carbonate, coupled with ethylene carbonate. So they're the solvents. Um, the salt then is a one molar LIPF6 salt, and we added 3 weight percent of each of these additives separately. So vinylene carbonate, fluor fluoroethylene carbonate, vinyl ethylene carbonate, and uh, LIBOB, so lithium bisoxalato borate. All of these had been used previously with, with uh, graphite, um, and some had been used with silicon previously. So we knew they had stabilizing effects on the SEI layer. Uh, so when we coupled them with uh, silicon nanowires now, so these are 100% silicon nanowire electrodes, we saw that there was a huge variation in the performance. So the VC outperformed all the rest uh, by a margin. Um, the FEC and the LIBOB performed similarly in terms of capacity retention, but the LIBOB, you can see um, the, the data was... Uh, not not the smoothest of data, I should say, and VEC the same. Um, the reason for that was, um, well, it's related to the SEI layer, but those are temperature effects, basically. Um, so as the temperature in the lab fluctuated, um, as the temperature went down in the lab, you get a reduction in capacity for those uh, electrolytes, or when you use those electrolytes, and when the temperature goes back to room temperature, um, or, 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 you know, so nighttime temperature is low, you get a low capacity, daytime temperature is higher, you get a higher capacity. So the, the, the VEC and the LIBOB were much more affected by temperature than the rest. And, and basically, we didn't show this, but previous uh, or other groups had shown that uh, the reason for that is the SEI layer um, is, is, uh, has an Arrhenius dependence, basically. So the lithium dif diffusivity through the SEI layer has an Arrhenius dependence, and that's more affected by those two uh, electrolyte additives. Um, okay, when we looked at the actual material then, um, after cycling in each of these electrolytes, we noted that for VC, so the best performing one, we did get this morphology transformation again. And actually for, for the three best performing one, we did get that morphology transformation. And you can see that ligament type structure forming again. For VEC, we did get it as well, but we also found these kind of amorphous kind of areas as well that, that did not have that ligament type structure. When we use no additive at all, the, the ligament structure did not form. Okay, so and that clearly showed why the no additive doesn't uh, uh, retain much capacity at all. It's because you're not forming a stable morphology or you're not evolving into a stable morphology. So uh, if you looked at SEM images of these, you can see then uh, clearly that the no additive, a lot of the material has actually, when you wash it, uh, you lose a lot of the material. So it's not well contacted to the current collector, whereas with VC it is. Uh, and, and actually for the, the three performing, best performing ones in terms of capacity retention, it is. So even after washing, uh, you can see the material is still very well adhered to the current collector. Whereas the no additive one, you can see a lot of bare patches there. Uh, the reason for that is because, again, the no additive one is not forming that stable morphology. It's forming this kind of amorphous mass, which is not well contacted to the current collector. We did some XPS to, to analyze the chemical composition of that, uh, th those SEI layers. Um, what we found was, so I'll direct your attention to the C1S spectrum, that for the two uh, VC and FEC electrolytes, there was a significant um, concentration of poly VC in the SEI layer. Um, and this is something we expected because it had been shown for graphite previously and for other silicon um, um, type electrodes. But basically uh, what poly VC does is it's, um, it's a polymer obviously, um, but it provides flexibility to the SEI layer. So if that's uh, in there in, in large enough concentrations, you get a more flexible SEI layer. 
So when the silicon expands, then it's less prone to cracking. Uh, sorry, the SEI layer is less prone to cracking. If the SEI layer is less prone to cracking, you get you, you don't get this continuous uh, deform, uh, deformation and reformation of the, the SEI layer. So you don't get this continuous decomposition of the electrolyte. Um, or at least it, it, you do get it, but to a much lesser extent than for a no additive type material. So that uh, the presence of that poly VC was was very, very important. Uh, we did so it was, it, for VC and FEC, we found it to be in there in around 6% concentration by weight uh, in the SEI layer. For LIBOB, it's not obvious here, but we did find it as well. It was in there in, in about 1% concentration. So that explained why that did uh, have a high capacity retention. Um, LIBOB, the, the capacity retention can also be explained by some other elements or other compounds that we found in the SEI layer. So boron semicarbonates, for example, that are less prone to dissolution. So not only with the SEI layer do you get cracking, but as you discharge uh, to 1.5 volts, for example, in, in a half cell, you, do, you can get dissolution of the, the SEI layer. And LIBOB um, is forms those boron semicarbonates are, are less prone to dissolution. So that that explained why this one had a high capacity retention, even though the the amount of poly VC was was less much less than than in the VC in the FEC. Um, we looked at so th th this XPS here is of the SEI layer. We also looked at we did XPS of the actual active material. So we washed off the SEI layer and just did XPS of the, the, the silicon that was left behind. Uh, this provided a very interesting result in that when we looked at the no additive material, we actually couldn't even uh, detect elemental silicon. So now XPS is obviously it's a surface technique, so it probes around 10 nanometers in, um, but we could not find uh, elemental silicon. So what that told us was that the SEI layer um, is, is so um, unstable that it keeps cracking and recracking. So not only does it keep the SEI layer keep reforming, but it, it when it does so, it, it actually consumes the silicon. So it's consuming the active material. So it's not only that the solvent molecules are, are decomposing, they're consuming silicon at the same time. And they form these lithium silicates. So these LIX, SI, OY type compounds. Once they form, uh, that's irreversible, so you won't get the elemental silicon back. So um, this really explains why the no additive material doesn't uh, form that ligament type structure, doesn't form that stable morphology, because basically the, the silicon is being consumed continuously. So you get that consistent capacity degradation when, when you don't use an additive. OK, for the all the other ones with the additives, fair enough, we did find those silicates as well, but we were able to detect elemental silicon. So below the surface, um, you know, 10 nanometers, or at least within 10 nanometers, we were able to, to detect elemental silicon. So it gave us a good indication why, as I said, the no additive doesn't form that stable uh, ligament structure, whereas the, the additives do. Um, we looked at ionic liquid electrolytes as well. Um, so uh, we, we did this in, in collaboration with a group in Rome. So um, Gianni Apatecci and, and a group in, so he's from Ania and a group in KIT. So uh, Professor Stefano Passerini, we looked at ionic liquid electrolytes. I won't spend too much time on this, but we did. Um, we did find that uh, we could get a boost in performance with ionic liquids, but we had to have those carbonates in there. So we had to have either EC or VC, and VC was the best again. Um, interesting point on this study was the majority of studies previously using ionic liquids for silicon had used the TFSI anion. Uh, we used the combination of the FSI and TFSI anion, and that gave us, um, it was the best performing silicon nanowire electrode in an ionic liquid at the time of publication. Now, maybe that has changed now, but um, at least at the time of publication it was. The reason for that was the FSI actually um, gives the, the electrolyte a lower viscosity and hence a, a higher ionic conductivity. Um, and that's the main reason. There, there are other reasons as well. So modeling, uh, not in our paper, but in other papers shows that um, Li plus so lithium ions um, have a weaker electrostatic interaction with the FSI anion than they do with the TFSI anion. Therefore, um, it favors desolvation if they're solvated by FSI. 
Um, so that lowers the energetic barrier to charge transfer. So that was, uh, we had a couple of interesting papers on that. Okay, so that's the SEI layer. And um, the, the last major challenge then um, is the, the low mass loading of, of nanowires. So to be, uh, if, if we look at a, a, a commercial graphite electrode, um, typically they have a charge storage capacity of about four milliamps milliamp hours per centimeter squared and that would correspond to about a mass loading of 11 milligrams per centimeter squared of the graphite if you want to just match that with silicon uh, and if you assume a, a capacity of silicon that your silicon is going to um, deliver a capacity of 2500 milliamp hours per gram you would need a mass loading of silicon nanowires of about 1.6 milligrams per centimeter squared Whereas if you look in the literature, uh, the typical mass loading of directly grown nanowires is, is much lower than that. So it's about 0.2 to 0.4 milligrams per centimeter squared. So that's clearly an issue if, if you want to commercialize silicon. Um, so we just published a paper in Advanced Materials. Um, so Sumer was the first author on this, um, tackling this problem basically. So looking at, can we increase the mass loading by using uh, different types of current collectors. And also, can we increase the flexibility, which is important if, if you want a, a flexible battery. So uh, basically what, what was done here was we, we took a, a stainless steel fiber cloth um, using the same nanowire growth technique. So using the solvent vapor growth system and using tin seeds. So uh, Sumer, he evaporated on the tin seeds and then in the solvent vapor growth system grew the nanowires. You can see this is a, an SEM of the pristine uh, fiber cloth, and this is a SEM of the, the seeds after evaporation. Uh, we wanted to, because mass loading was, was one of the key parameters we were looking at here, we wanted to look at um, a range of mass loadings to see how it affected uh, the, the performance. So by varying, uh, how much tin you deposited on, whether you deposit on single side or, or, or both sides of the of the cloth. And by varying reaction time, we were able to, to vary the mass loadings to between about a quarter of a milligram per centimeter squared up to 1.3. So we didn't, we couldn't reach the 1.6, which we tried to reach the 1.6 milligrams per centimeter squared, um, but this was the max we could get. So we had four different uh, data points at least. Um, if you looked at the, the cloth after growth, you can see from the low mass loading to the high mass loading, um, clearly for all of them, you get a, a dense growth of nanowires on the surface. But for the higher mass loading ones, the, the fibers of the cloth are no longer visible, okay, which is good. Okay, so and is what you'd expect, I guess, if you've uh, denser growth in there. But that's what you want because um, uh, you can see that the spaces in between the, the, the fibers are difficult to make out and you can see that the nanowires from uh, individual fibers are all intertwined with one another. Um, so that's important because what you want is those uh, that material to, to be well adhered to the current collector. And so if it's all intertwined with one another, then, then it will. Because if you have a planar current collector and you increase the mass loading to this level, the nanowires can actually behave somewhat like a film and delaminate and peel off. Um, so we wanted, we didn't want that to happen with this cloth, obviously. So um, the, 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 the structure of the cloth prevents that because the nanowires basically intertwine with one another. Um, and we were able to show that quite simply using sonication. So if you took a stainless steel file versus the stainless steel cloth and you sonicated it for up to an hour, the file, you can see the nanowires, uh, the solution becomes progressively darker and that's related to the nanowires just coming off the foil. Whereas if you do it with the cloth, um, you get no or very little at least uh, nanowires coming off. Uh, when these were tested in the battery, um, so they gave a, a very good performance. Um, so we could get up to 500 milliamp hour, or sorry, up to um, over a thousand milliamp hours per gram for over 500 cycles. Um, importantly, I suppose, while the very high mass loading one didn't uh, retain the, the, the same capacity that the lower mass loading one did, it still performed very well and was well over twice the capacity that graphite or that's achievable with graphite. Um, what was interesting was actually that they, they, they both tracked the same or more or less the same capacity up to about 200 or 250 cycles and it was only beyond that then that the higher mass loading one um, begun to, to decay a little bit faster. 
uh, we did uh, post mortem analysis of these, and we again we saw that the the interconnected structure did form. Um, I'll probably looking at time here, I'll, I'll skip over some of these uh, a little bit. But what was encouraging um, was, I suppose, that the morphology of the nanowires wasn't at fault here. The morphology of the the active material wasn't the problem here. So what we think is it was actually the SEI layer thickening caused the, the higher mass loading one to degrade a little bit more quickly than the lower mass loading one. And evidence of that is a shift in the differential capacity plot peaks to, to lower potentials. OK, um, so uh, flexible batteries was another, or uh, moving towards flexible batteries is another. It's, it's, it's um, if you look at the tech industry, so Samsung and, and, and Apple and, and all the rest want to move towards flexible phones. Uh, and they're they're already there somewhat, but if you want a truly flexible phone, you need a flexible battery. So using this stainless steel fiber cloth is is moving towards that, or is a way to get there. And uh, Sumer did this very nice video, I have to say, showing how robust that current collector is, even with twisting and and deforming it. You can see no material uh, delaminates or comes off the surface, um, which is you know exactly what you'd want. And even after the twisting and deforming. He, he put that into a cell then and you saw he got very good capacity retention as well. So it had no effect on the capacity retention of the silicon, um, which was great. OK, so that's kind of where we are, where where we're going now, I guess, is we're we're, we're still doing a lot of uh, research in, in lithium ion battery and advanced lithium ion, but we're also expanding beyond that, too. So we're looking to more sustainable technologies as well. So. Uh, the sustainability of, of lithium ion batteries is is questionable. So there are a number of concerns around it. So one being uh, cobalt is an essential element in, in the cathode, or at least in the majority of cathodes for lithium ion batteries. Uh, cobalt is mined in the Congo, so Democratic Republic of Congo, and there's some serious human rights issue there, uh, issues there related to mining. So a lot of child labor um, and you know, not so nice things like that. So there's, there's um, a lot of concerns about cobalt and cobalt mining. Likewise, lithium mining is unsustainable as well. Um, so the reserves are limited. Um, they're concentrated in Australia and South America. Um, and while the reserves are not an issue now, uh, but the EV manufacturing is ramping up. So if you look at Ireland's targets, um, Ireland want to have a million EVs on the road by 2030. So that's a lot of lithium that's going to be required. And that's just Ireland. So if you look globally, the demand for lithium is going to increase. So um, because the reserves are limited, that, that may have an impact on price. More importantly, the, the mining is actually it's not a very sustainable process. So if you look at lithium mining in South America, lithium is mined from um, salt lakes, basically. So the lithium is in there, it's dissolved up in these salt lakes. So to get the, the lithium, they evaporate off uh, these brines. So they evaporate the water off the brines. Uh, to get one ton of lithium carbonate, you have to evaporate off uh, half a million litres of water. Um, and, and these are already in, in areas a lot of the time that water is is actually a precious resource. So they're you know, in, in quite dry and arid areas. So that's not a sustainable process at all. Um, so there is a move to, to look towards more sustainable batteries. Um, Edmund mentioned the Trident project. So the, 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 one of the goals of the Trident project is to develop a sodium ion battery. So sodium ion battery is much more sustainable now um, because sodium obviously is ubiquitous. You know, sodium in the form of sodium chloride we find everywhere. OK, so you'll have it in the, the, the cupboard at home, I'm sure. Um, so sodium ion batteries eliminate the, the requirement for li lithium and cobalt. The materials are much more sustainable. They're also uh, less costly. So sodium salt, so our sodium carbonate is less than 10 times the, the price per kg of lithium carbonate. And the supply chains uh, can be located entirely in Europe. So if you're looking at a hard carbon anode or the elements in the cathode, which are much more u ubiquitous, like sulfur, phosphorus, iron, and so on, um, it, it's it, long term um, sodium ion batteries that, that there, there's no real risk to the supply chains, which is uh, another um, advantageous uh, property of it. Another good thing is that you can actually leverage the knowledge, the, the decades of research that's gone into lithium ion, you can leverage that in sodium ion because the chemistries are similar. They're, they're not exactly the same, obviously, but they're, they're very similar. 
Um, and the, because of the cost reduction, you do have the potential to reduce the cost of energy storage to less than five cent per kilowatt per cycle, which is a key target of the EU. Um, OK, so what we wanted to do is look or what we are doing now is and this is not part of the Trident project. This is this is a separate SEAI project, I should say, that's uh, Stephen O'Sullivan. Um, is doing this research. So he's looking at alloying materials rather than hard carbon as the anode. So what Stephen is doing is he's taking the copper current collector, he's growing inactive nanowires. So these copper silicide nanowires that are inactive materials. So basically they're acting as a, a current collector, but a, a high surface area current collector. So this is what the nanowires look like. So they're conductive. He then coats them with tin and antimony. So he evaporates on a bilayer. Um, 20 nanometers of tin and 20 nanometers of antimony. Um, he does that because uh, basically they, they buffer each other. They, they, they charge or they sodiate um, or ally with sodium at different potentials. So they, 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 the, the, while there is a volume expansion, each material tends to buffer the other during the, their respective volume expansion. So you can get an increased capacity retention by doing so. Um, so Stephen has, uh, because we're you know we're looking at relatively novel materials here Stephen has has developed his own concentration of electrolyte and developed his own electrolyte so he uses fec additive with dme and that gives the benefit of both the carbonate based uh, chemistry and and lime based uh, uh, chemistry as well and he's gotten uh, reasonably good performance with these um, so he's not long into this project but he's gotten up to 250 cycles with relatively stable capacity retention. And actually he has over a thousand cycles with a, 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 a bilayer on a, on a planar electrode as well. So that's very promising. Um, this work as well is to move even beyond sodium ion to another more sustainable uh, battery technology is, is to look at potassium ion batteries. So for the same reason that sodium ion battery is, is more sustainable and, and low cost, potassium ion batteries you know, have the same uh, or similar properties as well. Uh, if you couple that with the, the low reduction potential of the potassium, potassium ion um, versus standard hydrogen electrodes, so it's about minus 2.93 volts. Whereas if you look at lithium, it's minus 3.04. So they're very similar. So you, um, and, and that's what you want for, for an anode material. So you want it to, to have a, a low uh, reduction potential. So potassium ions, uh, potassium ion batteries are advantageous in that respect. So Sumer is taking a very similar approach to what Stephen uh, was taking, except Sumer is, going to, is, is using these copper meshes and he's growing the copper silicide nanowires on those copper meshes. And then he's evaporating on the antimony onto that. Uh, so you can see this is what the copper mesh looks like. And if you zoom in, he gets he gets very good and, and consistent growth of the copper silicide nanowires. Again, these are acting. They're not active materials. They're acting as a, a current collector almost and a, and a high surface area current collector. Um, Sumer has uh, excellent capacity retention with his material as well. So we're, we're very close to a thousand cycles with these. Um, uh, so a thousand being a, a very good milestone or a, a really nice milestone. So we're hoping that there's no uh, electricity blackouts or anything that, that stops this one, but it, it should reach a thousand cycles. And we're, we're hoping to get uh, published this and, and, and get a reasonably high impact publication from it because it, it vastly outperforms anything, um, that, to the best of our knowledge, any antimony uh, based paper for potassium ion batteries on the market today or, or published today, I should say. OK, so that is it. Um, so first of all, uh, yeah, to, to conclude, I suppose I'd like to acknowledge all the, the co-authors on, on all those papers that I, I just talked about. In particular, maybe call out Kevin and Hugh for uh, long time collaboration with 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 both of uh, both of you. So thanks for that. And, and all the other co-authors um, and the funding agencies. Um, thanks for the support. OK, so that's it. Thanks very much, Joe. Um, I'm just looking to see if there are some questions in the chat. Um, one second, I, I, and while I'm doing that, I, I have two particular questions, Hugh, or, or, or Ty, sorry. Um, in terms of the sodium uh, and potassium, how do they compare in terms of the lithium ion battery, in terms of where, like, you, you, you've got great performance now, and you want that, you, if you get to the thousand cycles, you, you'd hope uh, you'd be able to publish that. 
But how does that compare then with the, the, the lithium one? Yeah, so I suppose one thing, if, if you're to compare the technologies, um, one thing I, I should say is, yeah, lithium ion will always be the dominant rechargeable battery technology in terms of energy density, always. Um, and that's just related to the atomic size, basically, and, and the energy density you can get from it. So the, the goal of, of the sodium ion and potassium ion research is not to compete with lithium ion in terms of energy density, but it's to compete with it in terms of sustainability and costs. So certainly yeah. you can have a much more sustainable battery and a much lower cost battery, albeit it might not have the same energy density as lithium ion. But so I, I suppose the applications then will be different. So for lithium ion, the applications are electric vehicles, you know, mobile electronics, things that you have to carry around with you that you need to be small. Yeah. But for if you're looking at an application like stationary storage of, you know, renewable energy, for example, it's a battery that does not need to be moved around. That's where sodium ion and potassium ion will have their niche. And, and how do they compare? Like, is there an order of magnitude difference or is it 50 percent or what's the? No, no, it's 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 so if we look at sodium ion batteries, so if you look at the, you know, there actually are sodium ion batteries commercialized at the moment and energy densities, I think off the top of my head, there's one uh, produced by AMTE Power in, in the UK. It's about 160 watt hours per kg. Okay. Um, if you look at lithium ion, you can get about 260 watt hours per kg. Yeah. So it's, it's not a million miles away from it. Yeah, 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 yeah. One of the things I was curious though as well, when you when you're looking at the, I think it was sodium, you, you, you need to also use um, a tin, I think, to see the, the, the uh, uh, at least in the initial process. And you didn't have a, a challenge then because tin is also in, in you know, relatively short supply or there's a, it's, 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 a, it's an element where you, it's not readily abundant or readily available like um, silicon would be or sodium. Yeah, and I, I would definitely agree with that. Yeah, I would definitely agree with so the 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 yeah the long term I suppose um there there's going to be different anode materials in sodium ion and some are probably more sustainable than others. The hard carbon one, for example, which we're looking at in the Trident project, is a really sustainable one. Um we're we're using or we're we're taking some of Morris Collins's lignin derived hard carbon and using those. So that's very sustainable. But if if we want to move to tin, we get actually can get higher capacity. So there is a trade off, I would say, between okay. elemental abundance and the energy density that you can get. I would. Yeah. So so you're not you're not reliant on tin solely then, uh, unless you want the performance. Yeah. Exactly. If you want the, the the higher energy density, so the the energy density or the capacity of tin is about three times that of the carbon. You see, so yeah. there, there are definitely trade offs. I, I one one last question, uh, Ty. Um, just going way back to one of the slides you had there, where you you, you were talking about um, the nanowires and you're getting delithiation, and you kind of had each, each a cartoon of almost the pores and the actual uh, walls of the um, uh, of the wires, and then they kind of welded and cross linked. And I, I what I don't I don't understand about that is you're when you're when you're removing the lithium, you're creating a vacancy. But that indicates then that it's not it's not just intercalation like you would have it with the lithium ion battery where you um, uh, where you were at the graphite anode. Is, 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 is that is that correct? Yeah, no, that's absolutely correct. Yeah. So it's it's not intercalation, definitely not. No, it's it's an allying it's an allying yeah. that, that occurs. So because, but, because but then is it harder then because you have to you, you know you, you you start to form these um germanium, germanium or, or um, silicon, silicon bonds to uh, compensate for the, the vacancy. Do you then have a, a, an activation energy barrier to actually recharge that uh, electrode because you have to break those bonds again? Um, not really, because those bonds w are present anyway within what's, so what's left behind. So for example, you know, if you have Two nanowires side by side. Yeah. You know, after you delithiate, you still have, you know, a porous nanowire, for example, but you still have the silicon-silicon bonds. Um. So what the if you have two nanowires side by side that are connected, yeah. Um, 
the, the driving force there is actually if they're if they are connected to one another the driving force there is to to um, reduce the overall surface area in contact with the electrolyte so that's what that does um that, that's why that silicon silicon bond forms um so it, it's it's a surface energy um it's reduced the surface energy more than more than anything else um but you still whether, whether the welding formed or not you would still have silicon silicon bonds within the material anyway you know so it, it doesn't inhibit uh, lithiation afterwards. Yeah, okay, okay, okay. Thanks very much, Ty. Um, I I don't see any any, any questions in the uh, in the chat unless somebody is then I, I, I if not um yeah, sorry but, uh, Edmund, there are Marina. a couple of, sorry Edmund there are a couple of questions there in the chat. Yeah. Okay. Oh, how are you? Hi, Kevin, how are you? Good now, good yeah. yeah. Actually, uh, I was. Yes, um, so, uh, Ty, uh, Ty, do you think that the tin seeds on the tip of the silicon nanowires have any effect on the properties of the material uh, in, the, in terms of conductivity, as an example? They, they certainly do have a, um, they play a role as well. Um, we didn't look at conductivity, but the tin actually um, is an active material too. So the tin is uh, uh, will actually reversibly alloy with lithium as well so it's not even it, it's not in there just to see it, it actually is active as well so it actually in, in, increases the the capacity of your material as well um yeah we didn't look at conductivity but definitely that was something we were able to highlight is that we could see additional uh, plateaus and and peaks in in differential capacity plots that were uh, related to the reversible alloying of the tin as well and uh, hugh had, had a, a question there, Ty. Um, first of all, great talk, and I'd agree. Um, and the question that uh, Hugh has is, do you think the stainless steel cloth anodes could be used uh, for bipolar cell design to maximize the energy density? I would say yes. I would say yes. Um, so the bipolar design is, is where you want, you know, you need active material on both sides. So the, yeah. the, these stainless steel cloths are, you know, they, they seem very uh, amenable or, or optimal for that. We, it's not something we've looked at, Hugh, but I think, you know, it, certainly looking at some of the European calls um, coming down the line, maybe the, these bipolar type designs um, are something that maybe the, the, the battery industry is moving towards. So I think it's certainly something we, we should and, and maybe will look at. OK. OK. Um... Thanks very much, Ty. And I, I don't see any, any other questions. So, um, could I just um, say well done? And uh, it'd be great to see you get through a thousand cycles in that last test you're running. And hopefully, you'll we'll be able to get that published fairly soon. How long does it take in terms of what sort of time frame is that? I, that that's a good question. Actually, a funny story. I had a conversation with Sumer about that only last week or the week before, and. Um, He's, he knows exactly how, how long that one is running because he put it on around the same time his son was born. So it's about six okay. or seven months now, I think, at this stage. So while his, his, his son obviously is, is his uh, most important thing in his life, this, this test is his work baby. So. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, hopefully, hopefully, hopefully go over a thousand. Yeah, hopefully. Right. Uh, thanks very much, Ty. And uh, uh, thanks very much to everybody for attending. Okay, that's it for today. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Thanks, Evan.